Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sumha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sumha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sumha Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So that's a traditional invitation to a Dhamma talk and homage to the Triple Gem, a way of recollecting the teaching which we owe this practice to. And I find it interesting to lead a forgiveness meditation because when you bring up people's family, you can kind of intuit this collective Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> and we do have to be kind, knowing what our current capacities are for forgiveness and to forgive ourselves when we can't meet those standards for ourselves. It's okay. But there's a real power to the Buddha's standard he sets for us, which is a standard that does not validate anger or resentment in any form. There was a BBC special where different religious officials were interviewed about the seven deadly sins. And each tradition, except for Buddhism, which was represented by the Dalai Lama, said that there was a place for a certain measure of anger a righteous anger. And the Dalai Lama was clear that in Buddhism there is not. There's the famous simile of the saw where the Buddha says, this is in, I think, Majjhima Nikaya 21, people may speak to you with words that are kind or unkind, timely, untimely, gentle, harsh, truthful, untruthful, etc. And in every situation, one should determine we will remain unmoved and not let ill will overcome our minds. We will speak no evil words, but remain abiding with a mind concerned for their welfare out of compassion. And one can nod their head and say, okay, that sounds valid. And then the Buddha goes on and says, even monks, if a band of bandits were to dismember you limb by limb with a two-handled saw at a crossroads, those among you who gave rise to even a single thought of ill will would not be doing my bidding. So there's the standard. <laughs> at your next family gathering, keep that standard in mind. But this isn't to say that we can expect ourselves to meet that. That's the domain of the enlightened beings, largely. And we have to forgive ourselves for where we're at. And there's an important distinction between repression and suppression. Repression is the unwholesome act of mind that says, I'm not angry, I'm not angry, even though you are, and refuses to acknowledge what's there. And shoving it down makes it, in some sense, stronger. Jung said that that which we dis do not acknowledge becomes our destiny. Suppression, we 
like as Buddhists. Suppression says, okay, I'm angry. I see this. I will not act or speak from this anger. I will not act or speak from this anger. Because in the Buddhist conception, any action undertaken from anger is unwholesome. It has a measure of unwholesomeness in it. And the caveat here is one can do great good and be appropriately firm and decisive and protective and powerful, but one can do so from a state or a place of loving kindness. And action taken from a space of loving kindness is always more meaningful. There's a rule in the monastic discipline where before we admonish another monastic, we have to make sure that we choose the right time, that we speak honestly, that we ask permission and receive permission, and this is the big one, that we speak from a mind of loving kindness. And until we meet these conditions, we don't step into that role of speaking in an admonishing fashion. So you begin to really see the power and the completely different trajectory of a conversation taken in the moment out of reactivity, even a slight measure of ang anger, versus one where you make yourself wait, you don't speak, and you find in a few hours or a few days or a few years, you have a spaciousness which lets you speak from a genuine place of care, and the conversation is completely different because you really see the other person. This is the power of waiting, of suppressing the doing of action based on kama, or based on anger, and not creating new kama in that vein. And this is our standard as, as Buddhists. And even if we can't meet it every time, and note when you're becoming angry at yourself, because that also doesn't really work. But it's helpful to know the standard. It's helpful to bring to mind the Buddha's ethic of forgiveness. There was a king, King Bimbasara, who was one of the Buddha's chief disciple or lay disciples, a stream enterer, which means he'd achieved a measure of awakening, and a wonderful ruler of Rajagaha. And his king or his son, King Atitasattu, murdered him and committed patricide and took the reins of power. And there's a sutta in the longer length discourses, the second sutta, Diganakaya 2, where King Achitasattu, the patricide, comes to the Buddha and challenges him about the fruits of the holy life, about his path. And after a long discourse, it's worth noting that the Buddha doesn't refuse him. He doesn't say, I'm not going to receive this person. He says, he teaches him Dhamma, and at the end, King Atatasattu is so moved by the teaching, he says, I've committed a bad action. I've murdered my father, a good man. And the Buddha says, one who acknowledges fault and determines to restrain themselves in the future grows in the discipline of the noble ones. And the forgiveness there and the faith that eventually made King Atatasattu become a good ruler. And eventually he sponsored the first council of Buddhist monastics gathering to uh, formalize the teaching. And this isn't to say that we don't admonish or draw boundaries. And the Buddha certainly admonished and drew boundaries plenty with his monks. But he also knew a time and a place, he, there was never a person he thought was beyond redemption. And his openness and care, the famous story of Angulimala, the bandit who murdered, I believe the number in the suttas is 999 people, 
It's a very round Buddhist number. I'm assuming it's slightly exaggerated, but a lot of people. And the Buddha finds him, and Angulimala in the story chases down the Buddha trying to kill him and just can't catch up uh, because in the suttas the Buddha is using his psychic powers. And he yells out to the Buddha, stop. And the Buddha turns and says, I have stopped. You should stop. And he teaches in the Dhamma. And Angulimala attains awakening. And then when his karma comes back to him, when the people of the town and the village throw stones at him as a murderer, the Buddha looks at him bleeding and says, bear it, Brahmin, bear it. The karma you incur now could have been much worse. And this forgiveness, taking even a murderer, even someone who'd killed so many, and knowing that even they were not beyond the path. Because in this conception, all unwholesome action is undertaken from ignorance, from avijja. We don't understand. We are all subject to dukkha. Father Zosima in the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky's novel, I've heard it's named one of the best novels of all time. He's this Christian monastic teacher and he says you should look at all people as children or as patients in a hospital. And if you really can take that to heart and look at those around you, not expecting them to behave like adults, the Buddha said the only people who are actually sane are the arahants. The rest of us are in various states of derangement. So can we look at those around us and just, we're children. We're all trying our best. We're in our little adult clothes. And some of us are sick. And some of us are sick children. <laughs> and what a sigh of relief if you realize that about those around you, compassion is the response. There's an interesting term, justice. And Nietzsche in the genealogy of morals, of morality, speaks, he traces back these terms that sound so noble. And he reveals below the surface how many of them are rooted in these deep primal urges of the human. And justice, he traces back to the desire for revenge and for power. And it's true, that term is held up, but it's not a Buddhist word. There's a, there's a place, there's a note in that word. Obviously, we work towards alleviating inequality. Obviously, we work towards holding people accountable. But in the end, it's about healing. And justice carries a note of retribution and revenge Often justice entails great cruelty in the name of good. And in Buddhism, there's no room for ends justifying the means. In Buddhism, because intention is the quintessential element in all karma and action, the means are the ends. The means are the ends. So yes, we work for the betterment of society. We can work to rehabilitate, to heal, to forgive. But justice is not a Buddhist word. And it's interesting how we can trace the unwholesomeness of anger in our own lives with the people we know. We feel its burn. But how hard it is to spot 
when it's out there in the newspaper. Or maybe we feel we're wise enough to spot the unwholesomeness of polarization and anger towards the more obvious perpetrators of action. But what about the political parties within our own country who don't quite agree with us about that? Are we forgiving to them? The standard is high. And just to note that fixation and how that same impulse towards anger and such can manifest insidiously and constantly and truly darken people's minds when it's projected onto the current events of the day or anything. Rather than that ethic of forgiveness, we watch the righteousness grow. The Buddha speaks about the step the contemplation one takes towards any unwholesome state in order to let go of it as the threefold contemplation where one sees the attraction, the drawback, the escape. We often see the drawback of anger, but until we also see the attraction of it, then we can't let go. And the attraction of anger which the Buddha said, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root is the sense of self. There's nothing virtually so addictive as self-righteous anger. It orients, it gives us power over a world we sometimes feel powerless against, that rearing up internally. It's intoxicating and that's the attraction. And until we see that attraction, then it will keep rising. The Buddha spoke about three kinds of minds. He said one may have a mind like stone. One angers quickly and the anger is slow to fade. And this is like words carved into stone, they remain. One can have a mind like sand. One angers quickly, but it is quick to fade. Like words written into sand are blown by the wind and quickly fade. But one should attempt and train to have a mind like water, where words are written and they disappear immediately. One, is, one does not get angry, and whatever moment of anger one has fades quickly, immediately. That can be quite a skillful means, actually. If you have a certain phrase coming up in your mind, a repetitive thought, then imagine writing the words on water and watch them disappear. So it's useful to see this and to see just how we fixate. The events of the day are difficult and they are real and they are tragic. And there are times to sign petitions and to donate to the correct nonprofits and to stay informed enough. But how many times a day do we have to check our iPhone for that to be the case? And it's also important to zoom out a little bit. We can think this is, these events of the day are utterly unique. There's never been any, you know, this is a moment more brutal than anything we've encountered. Think back to the war of, yes, of last year. Think back a few more to the other crisis. You move through history and history was always breaking. And even in the Buddha's time, King Atatasattu, who I mentioned, after he killed his father, he invaded the Vajrans. The Buddha's clan and the commentaries was massacred after later on in his life, although that may have been later interpolation wars, famine, and more. And this doesn't diminish the tragedy of the day, but the wider vision allows us to hold the whole of humanity with compassion in a way that's wholesome, instead of fixating on one thing as a 
kind of dazzling object of entertainment, of feeding off of it. And you can see that, like when the conversation comes up again in over dinner around something that's going on, and you just hear that kind of concerned clucking, you know, and you know that the, the feeling from those conversations isn't always just wholesome. There's something else going on. And it's useful to zoom out. And yes, these are real issues. Yes, we should have compassion. But so much else accumulates when we fixate. And there really is a sense where becoming and in, staying informed becoming s becomes staying entertained. These things are juicy. That's not good. Imagine the feeding off of this suffering. It's not good. So can you zoom out? And can you be attentive to that line, that distinction in one's mind? And can we think not of justice with the note of retribution, but rather of forgiveness, of healing, of skillful means, not just externally, not just in terms of the political parties of our own world, but in terms of our family, of those close to us, and very importantly, towards ourselves. Forgiveness is the motion of letting go. And that's not an easy motion. The Buddha said, or Ajahn Chah said that 70% of the practice is knowing you should let go of something and not being able to. Forgiveness is nourished by metta, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion. And it's grounded in an understanding of conditionality. Maya Angelou said, can you forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it? Can you forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it? Because how could it have been otherwise? We all are doing our best. So to learn to cultivate this ethic of, of radical forgiveness, and that is the standard of healing. And so often, you need a rotating tool belt to get towards that forgiveness. And sometimes that will entail putting things out of your mind for a time. Sometimes you're not ready to forgive yet. And the Buddha said in uh, one of the suttas that it's okay in such a s situation to not bring someone to mind. It's okay. So you can do that. Write their name on a piece of paper, tuck it in a drawer, and determine not to think about it for three months until you bring out the paper and look at it again. And then if you can approach it with a wholesome mind state, then maybe you're ready to bring them to mind and work with it. There's also the understanding of conditionality, of seeing, because we've all had the experience where we understand someone's childhood or what they're going through at home, and there's a sense of, oh, of, of course they're like this, of course. If we understood conditionality truly, we could never be angry at anyone. It all makes sense. So much of the chewing over in anger is not understanding how it can be wrong like this. And to realize with conditionality, when you understand the full scope, it all makes sense. Of course it was like this. It doesn't mean we don't change it. It doesn't mean it was good but there's a sense of the heart being able to accept. And that very much goes for ourself. What led to these patterns which we fall into again? How are they survival mechanisms? This is where forgiveness hides. And then towards our parents, this is worth holding up. That relationship is sacred in the Buddhist conception. There is mother and father and all of our parents mess us up in very unique ways. It's inevitable. You've messed your children up, obviously, definitely. And yet, they're so, we, the Buddha said you need to be so grateful for, for what they've given you. He said, the only way you can repay your parents, well, <laughs> what is it? One could hold their parents on their shoulders, carrying them around for 100 years, feeding them with them defecating over their shoulders and one would still not repay them. 
or, <laughs> but if one teaches them the Dhamma and establishes them in faith, then one has repaid their parents. The Buddha used very graphic images if you haven't picked that up yet. The point's well taken though. With one's parents, when there's estrangement, when there's a conflict, as a child, you know, obviously you need to establish boundaries when there's genuine damage, when there's genuine not safe situations. But whenever there is that mo motion or opening to approach the relationship again, to forgive, it is our duty as children to do that. In Thailand, once a year, the children will come up to the parents and wash their hands and bow to them and ask for forgiveness. We owe our parents that, always, always, to bow and be willing to be the first to approach our parents. It's just worth holding up because it's forgotten. And obviously, sometimes there is a place for pulling back, for cutting off contact if it's damaging, but just to hold that in mind. So, I'll just finish with one sutta which I love that I've brought to mind many, or brought to the talks many times, but it's the means of renouncing resentment. The Buddha says one should look at someone who is impure in body but pure in speech as a monk in need of cloth would approach a piece of dirty cloth on the ground and using his feet, tear off the dirty from the clean section and pick up just the clean section. So one looks to the good in a person. One should approach one impure in speech, but pure in body, as a man dying of thirst would come to a pond covered in algae and clearing away the algae would wade in and drink and then move on. So one clears away the scum and drinks the goodness. One should approach a person impure in body and impure in speech, but with occasional moments of clarity and mindfulness. As a man dying of thirst would come to a hoof print filled with a little bit of water and bending their lips down to the water, drink so as not to disturb the silt. So when one comes across a person like that, you don't trigger them, you don't stir the silt, but drink what goodness is there and then move on. It's interesting, in each of these images, the Buddha says, then you move on. You don't have to stay with those people all the time. One should approach someone impure in body, impure in speech, without occasional moments of clarity and look at them as one would look at a man starving, dying of thirst, sick, wandering over the desert, thinking, may this man not come to misfortune, may he not die, may he be helped. Even so, one should think, may this person be established in goodness, may they not come to misfortune, out of compassion. And one should approach and think of one pure in body, pure in mind, with moments, with clarity and mindfulness, as one would approach an oasis and a cool pool, and wading into the pool, drink, and then lie down on the bank and rest. May you all find such banks. So we have about seven minutes for Q&A, and then we have a special robe offering ceremony with some community from Australia who might be popping into the Zoom as we speak. But if you have a question or a comment or something to talk about, just raise your hand. We'll bring a mic over to you and say your name, and you can ask. And if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand or type something into the chat. Same with YouTube. 
So how to share merit or how to conceive of giving goodness to a world and people who sometimes seem very unwholesome, seem bent on harm, and how to do that with wisdom in a way that's effective. You know, the first thing to note is that in every list, including those of the four states of loving kindness, there's always a representative of wisdom. And in the Brahma Viharas, uh, the states of loving kindness, equanimity or equipoise is that state. And it's always brought to bear is, you're right, there's certain beings who you can, if saying merit uh, is goodness, basically, we can translate that for everyone, goodness and happiness. So sharing goodness and happiness with people through our practice and through our actions. And you're right that there are people in our lives we can do that very directly with. Uh, you can interact with them, um, speak about Dhamma with them, or simply share a certain brightness of spirit. But then there's people who are damaging and are really trapped in unwholesome habit patterns. And it's worth noting that it's okay. The Buddha gives permission to not engage with those people in depth. As with many of the Buddhist analogies, you'll notice the ones that ended that suit with that suit at the end, there there's a lot there. The monk who comes across the person impure in body, he doesn't touch the cloth with his, with his hands. He uses his feet. You know, there's there's a place for keeping distance when you need distance. And one really meaningful thing is to understand that part of anatta, this understanding of not self, is understanding that people are amalgamations of sankhara, largely, of these habits and programs that they run, personality, wholesome, unwholesome, etc. And which programs are you feeding? Which parts of the person are you feeding? Because if you're interacting with someone who, a friend who loves to gossip or engage in these unwholesome things and you're just kind of interacting with that or listening, you're feeding an un, you're supporting and feeding an unwholesome habit pattern and that won't lead to their w welfare or benefit. And it's really okay to not, to pull back. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm hurting this person by not interacting with them, you can understand, you know what? Every time I interact with this person, I end up supporting some pattern in them which is genuinely unwholesome. So either I'm gonna pull back from that relationship or I'm gonna have it happen on my own turf. You can use a skillful means. For example, if you find that there's a lot of people in your life you no longer connect with as much or they have certain unwholesome patterns, um, you know, it, instead of, say, cutting them all off in a violent way, maybe you just have a large dinner you host at your house once a month and you invite over all the friends who you're a little bit unsure about <laughs> and um, get it all out of the way in one go and it's on your turf, you can control the conversation, you can just be in this place of hospitality, and it works, honestly, it works. Like, you can be strategic. And then there's um, also a place for noting that some people, um, just because you're abiding in goodwill does not mean we're naive or don't draw strong boundaries. You just notice the difference between a reaction out of anger and responding from wisdom. And often all the differences is waiting a little bit and noticing the difference in the internal dialogue between kind of Mara's internal voice that says, you know, that wants just to vent your anger. But there's also a really dharmic voice that can come, which can also be very firm and say, it's time to stop this now. So all to say that when we spread merit, quote unquote, what it means is we're, you know, in our meditation, yes, we imagine this and, and use it as a dedication, but in day-to-day -day life, it just means how do we embody goodness and skillfulness? And that's gonna entail everything from explicit acts of connection and giving with those we can connect with, to skillful means with those we have to connect with, but maybe we recognize some unwholesome qualities to the relationship, 
to pulling back completely and just saying, I'm going to spread metta from afar to this person. I'm going to have equanimity, but there's not room for genuine interaction. And the wish for metta doesn't have to be, may this person get what they want, because sometimes they don't want good things. But one can also say, may that person know the happiness of non-greed. May this person know the happiness of non-anger. May this person know the happiness of, of non-delusion.